For the first time in decades, every major investment group is on track to close lower for the year. Stocks, bonds, commodities. The markets may be at a crossroads, and few people have their finger on the pulse of what could happen next, like Double Line's Jeffrey Gundlach. There are negative parts, unintended consequences, negative parts to this tax package. Pushing up for 3% will put a drag on the stock market. Today, the Bond King is with us live in Los Angeles for an hour for an exclusive interview. Here's Scott Wapner with Jeffrey Gundlach. Welcome to Los Angeles. Jeffrey, thank you so much for having us back. Well, thank you. Welcome to Double Line. Almost a year to the day that we were last with you. It was December 13th last year. That's right, and we're still volatile uh, in the market. Today is uh, another representation of that. Yes. We're still about 50 points above on the S&P of the February lows. Yes. You think we're going to go below that? Well, in the fullness of time, I think absolutely we'll go below that. I'm pretty sure this is a bear market. I mean, people like this definition of 20% down as a bear market, but that's obviously very arbitrary. I've been around for over 35 years in this business, and I've seen a number of bear markets, and it's more about kind of how you lead into it, how it develops, and how the sentiment changes. And I think we've had pretty much all of the variables that characterize a bear market. I mean, I remember, you know, going, usually something happens that really doesn't make any sense at all, and um, kind of amazed at how it goes on longer than it should. Like back in the dot-com days when companies were being IPO that had no sales, <laughs> let alone any revenue. That's hard to believe. And they would actually explode to the upside on the IPO. That's kind of crazy. And then we had the you know, subprime lending with pick-a-pay loans back in 05 and 06. And that was kind of crazy. And that went on longer than it should have. And this time, like we talked about a year ago, it was cryptos, Bitcoin which was truly a mania. I mean, as we talked about a year ago, it just went up for, you know, maybe in the end it's a good thing or the, the, te the blockchain technology is a good thing, but the way it was being treated and being believed in was a mania. And then it crashed about a week after we met a year ago and it was at 17,500 when we were speaking right in the spot. And of course now it's down about below 3,500, so about an 85% decline. And then one after another, you started to see various sectors of the global financial markets give it up. I mean, the global stock market peaked January 26th, and so did the New York Stock Exchange Composite January 26th. But the Dow Jones Industrials, you know, the uh, NASDAQ, the S&P 500, all these things, one by one, started to roll over. And then come the summertime, or later in the summertime, it, you were down to the fangs, and then you were down to two stocks. It was Amazon and Apple, and then Amazon gave it up, and then finally, when they decided they weren't going to tell you how many phones they sold anymore, Apple gave it up. That was the last straw? In, in that was mind. kind of the last straw, yeah. And it was really, you know, October 3rd, when the tariffs, well, it was that uh, USMC, whatever it's called, it's really NAFTA, but now it's called USMCA or whatever it is. And it, it was announced that those, t you know, that we would have this uh, change in NAFTA that would lead to a requirement that a certain fraction of car parts be made in higher cost locales, which basically meant not Mexico. And a senior executive at Ford Motor said, well, obviously, we're going to have to raise the prices on our cars if the input prices are going up. And suddenly, the market seemed to wake up to the fact that this was real. And the next day, um, the stock market tipped over. In fact, on October 3rd, Jay Powell said, we're a long way from neutral. That was, and that was a big problem, too. That seemed to be the tipping point. Yes, that was with the USMCA thing and the Ford Motor Executive. Those things seemed to come together and coalesce into, we've had enough. And yeah, so the Jay Powell thing was really interpreted by the market as a scary thing, that the Fed was really going to keep going a, a long distance further. And then the market dropped over 10%, and suddenly the Fed had to massage the rhetoric. And suddenly it was, well... We have a new definition of neutral, maybe. We're actually within the lower bound or close to the lower bound of neutral in an attempt to stabilize the market. So, yeah, it, it seems like a bear market to me in the way that things trade with late day volume being bad and the like. The best thing for the near term, I think, is that the most export sensitive stock market, South Korea, the COPSI, bottomed October 29th. So at least that's not pushing to the nose, and at least emerging markets broadly are doing a little bit better because they're extremely export-driven. So maybe this leg down 
is getting toward ex an exhaustion point. The sentiment's pretty dark right now. I'd be happier on the short-term outlook if the VIX would go above 40, you know, which is usually that would a sign. Be, that would be quite a spike. Well, it, that's typically what happens when you get at a bottom. There's so much uh, nervousness and, and fear. But the VIX is a little bit disturbing how it doesn't go higher, actually, as the, as the market pushes uh, to the downside. But I think this is a bear market, and I think we're going to go below the February lows almost with certainty. Is it a long-lasting bear market, or can it be a short term, as some have suggested on our air, and then this uh, secular bull market will resume? I don't think so. I, I think it's a bear market. I think we've had the, the first leg down, and the second leg down is usually more painful than the first leg down if this is indeed a bear market. So maybe in the short term, um, we're getting flushed out. But I think, I think this lasts a long time. And I, it, it has a lot to do with the fact that I believe that we're in a situation that is maybe unprecedented, it's too strong, but it's highly unusual that we're increasing the budget deficit so spectacularly, so late in the cycle, while the Fed is hiking interest rates. I know you've teased this segment by talking about the suicide mission thing I've been talking about for months. Yes, the Fed almost that's, seems that's like they're on a said. suicide mission. Well, what I mean by that is the deficit in the United States is extraordinarily high for where we are in the economic cycle and given what the debt level accumulated is already. I mean, in the first two months of fiscal 19 here that was just announced last week, the deficit, if you, there's a funny thing that happened in November where the payments for December ended up being pushed in November because December 1st was on a Saturday. But if you take that out, that's $44 billion. So that's a big number. If you take that out and say, pretend, okay, we're going to call that December and not November, still the first two months of fiscal 19, October and November, the budget deficit is going up at an annualized rate of $1.62 trillion. And that's the official budget deficit. The actual budget deficit is larger than what they report. For example, for fiscal 18, which ended September 30th, the official budget deficit was around $800 billion. But the national debt went up by $1.3 trillion almost. Now, why? What's the difference there? Well, there's items that are off budget. So the budget deficit really for fiscal 18 was $1.3 nearly trillion. Well, that's 6% of GDP. And we're supposedly having a good economy. And we're supposedly, you know, having well, jobs, growth, and all this other great stuff. But in actuality, we increase the deficit by 6% of GDP. Well, since government deficit change is a significant fraction, uh, a significant variable in the GDP equation, it just seems to me that there's almost really no real economic growth that's happening away from the deficit. So what worries me is that as we move into a weaker economy, which will happen at some point, and certainly the economy looks weaker now than it did entering 2018, that the deficit will continue to expand at a rate which could be prohibitive for the usual decline in interest rates helping to stimulate the economy. And that's what I think is the real big variable that investors need to focus on. And while this is happening with the deficit exploding, the Fed's raising interest rates, which means the interest expense is going to be increasing year by year as these uh, zero interest rates that we had for a number of years start to roll off and the bonds have to be refloated once they mature, the next uh, five years we have something like seven trillion dollars of treasuries that are maturing. The average coupon on those treasuries is almost as low as two percent, slightly higher, 2.1. Just call it two percent. Well when they roll over they're going to be at a higher interest rate because the Fed has been on the suicide mission of raising interest rates. So the interest expense on that $7 trillion of treasuries is going to be, well, maybe the rate will be at 3% like it is now, or maybe 4%. And so you might even see that we have an interest expense that goes up by $100, $140 billion. So kind of the profligacy of our government is coming back to haunt us ultimately. In financial markets, these things go on so much longer than they should. You know, Ross Perot ran for president running infomercials about we were doomed on the deficit. And there was a book written in 1992, that same, same year, that was uh, somewhat sponsored by the Peterson Foundation. It was called Bankruptcy 1994. And the idea behind that book was we have this compounding curve and this debt problem that is going to come back and really cause us problems. Well, he was early. <laughs> he was early by at least 26 years. But he's right. And you, you can't go, keep going on with a debt finance scheme 
Uh, and I'm worried that when the next recession comes, we could be looking at, well, heck, we're in, supposedly in a good economy, and for the first two months of this fiscal year, we're running $1.6 trillion. What if we go into a recession? What's the deficit going to be? $3 trillion? And does that mean that interest rates don't go down during the next recession, which is an idea I've been noodling around with for a long time? Maybe they go higher. So I've had a, a call for the last over two years that come 2021, the 10-year Treasury will be at 6%. And I get a lot of pushback. There's a lot of debt deflationists out there in the, in the Twitter sphere and the blog sphere, and they say you're absolutely wrong. The economy can't handle higher interest rates. But, you know, interest rates might have a life of their own. It might not matter what the market can handle or can't handle. They haven't to this point. It's been somewhat surprising that rates have remained where they are. I mean, you said 3%. They hit 3%, 3 and a quarter, got to 3 and a quarter. Yep. And here we are below 2.9 today. Yes, on the 10-year. I, I was really focusing on the 30-year, which I thought when it broke above 3.25, that was incredibly important. Frankly, I didn't think we'd ever go back below 3.25 uh, once we broke above because it seemed like such an important level. But here we are, we're back below 3.25, but not impressively. Not in a way that would be consistent with a big decline in the global stock market. There's a thing called a death cross. It's the 50-day moving average goes below the 200-day, day. and particularly when they're both declining, it's a death cross. Um, presently, about 80% of the countries in the MSCI World Index are in a death cross. 80%. That's amazing. And there was a, a chart that got a lot of play that was put out by Deutsche Bank about how many um, risk assets globally are in officially bear markets down that arbitrary 20% number that, again, I don't really ascribe to, but it's so commonly used that they used it. And it's like the highest in the data series, going back to 1901. It's like 90% of the risk assets around the world in dollar terms are in bear markets. So it's a pretty uh, widespread and coordinated a set of weaknesses. Are, are you saying that by embarking on this suicide mission that the Fed shouldn't raise interest rates this week? I don't really think that's the main thrust of my idea. It's uh, and this week, yeah, I think they shouldn't raise them this week. You, I agree, you think I they agree shouldn't? With no, I don't think they should. The bond market is basically saying, you know, Fed, you've got uh, no way you should be raising interest rates. Look at the twos, threes, five-year part of the yield curve, which are flat at 270. I mean, I guess that is corroborative of maybe a hike, but it's basically saying that in the year 2019, you're going to have a cut. This big, but a cut. That's what's priced into the yield curve. And in 2020, another cut. So you know, I, the, the, the problem, though, isn't that the Fed shouldn't be raising. The problem is the Fed shouldn't have kept them so low for so long. Sure. The problem is that we shouldn't have had negative interest rates like we still have in Europe. We shouldn't have done quantitative easing, which is a circular financing scheme. But the problem really is the deficit. The Fed is kind of helpless here. The fact that the deficit is so out of control this late in the economic cycle, we have never before had the Fed raise interest rates while the budget deficit was expanding. It's never happened because usually the budget deficit expands in response to a recession. It's a way of stimulating to get us out of recession. But instead, we did it as a last gasp of keeping this economic recovery going by making it completely deficit-based. So this morning, President Trump once again tweeted about the Fed, quote, it's incredible that with a very strong dollar and virtually no inflation, the outside world blowing up around us, Paris burning, China way down, <clears throat> that the Fed is even considering another interest rate hike. Take a victory, he said. Stan Druckenmiller today, op-ed Wall Street Journal. The Fed should, quote, pause its double-barreled blitz of higher rates and tighter liquidity. Mm. So they're right. You agree with them. I do agree with them. I've been saying this pretty much all year. The, the double-barreled was actually, I mean, he may have borrowed that from me. That's what I've been talking about. That's what I've been phrasing it um, all year. That we're really been tightening interest rates in a way that's more than people understand. There's a duo of economists at the Atlanta Fed called Wu and Shaw who did a study a few years back. What was the effect of quantitative easing? If they hadn't done the quantitative easing, and instead had taken the European model and gone to negative interest rates, how negative would those rates have had to be to have the same stimulative effect as the quantitative easing? And they concluded, and I don't know if they're right or not, it's very hypothetical, but their conclusion was that the quantitative easing amounted to 300 basis points 
of further cuts. So we, if they had done quantitative easing to have the same stimulus effect, Fed funds would have had been negative 300 basis points. Well, let's just say they're right. Since they did about two and a half trillion of quantitative easing, and it was 300 basis points, two and a half trillion divided by three is roughly $800 billion. Okay? So $800 billion is, $800 is, uh, divided by four means that's how, what quantitative easing is one cut. So 100 basis points is 800 billion, so divide by four. 25 basis points is $200 billion of quantitative easing. Well, so far, we're pushing towards 400 billion, we're not there yet, but we're soon to be there, of quantitative tightening. That means we've had two more rate hikes from quantitative tightening if Wu and Shaw are right. So the Fed hasn't just raised rates in that context eight times, they've raised them 10 times. And the quantitative tightening is, um, stated to be as high as 600 billion over, the over fiscal 19. So that's another three rate hike. So if they were really gonna follow their dots and raise rates so many times, there's another three on top of that. So the amount of tightening has been uh, under underappreciated, I think, and Stan is right, as he often is, is one of the greatest investors ever for uh, him and Chanos, I think, are the two of the, the two titans of the hedge fund industry. They're right that we are seeing the bond market react in a way that is historically very predictive of the Fed should not be doing this. And yet, we have this strange dynamic that they've almost promised a rate hike here in December, and then the president shows up with his tweets trying to bully them into not doing it, and it puts Jay Powell and the team in a very tough position because they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. You know exactly what people are gonna say if this week they don't hike. They're gonna say that Powell bowed to Trump's pressure and the criticism that he's taken. Could well be, it's either that or probably also the stock markets and the global stock markets pressure as well. The argument that I have to laugh at though that I hear on financial media is people get up there and they say if the Fed doesn't hike it's going to be super bad for the market because people be afraid that the Fed knows right. some super secret bad news. What a joke. The Fed doesn't have any supernatural powers. They know what we know. They don't know any more than we know. I know they have 700 PhD economists, which is an amazing number, but they didn't see the lending problems back in 2006, so they didn't have supernatural powers back then. I doubt they have them now. I think if the Fed doesn't hike, it'll be because the stock market is weaker, and also the global economy is slowing down. I mean, things like the City data, Citigroup data change series, every region is now negative. All, even the United States has flipped slightly negative. And what that does is it says, what's the economic uh, trend relative to the last 12 month average? And now it's below everywhere. So yeah, I mean, the data is definitely slowing. And the last quarter of GDP, I mean, the president loves to talk about this as the greatest jobs economy ever, which is completely untrue. There were more jobs per month under Obama's last two years than there have been under Trump's first two years. You know, he likes to talk about how, how great it is, but the last quarter GDP of three and a half percent real was all inventories just about. If you take inventories out, inventory building, real GDP was 1.2 in the third quarter. That's it. Down from a massive number in the quarter before that because that quarter had a did, had, uh, lot less inventory building. So the economy is, is definitely slowing down. It, the, the, uh, unemployment claims weekly are kind of bottoming out. The one thing that's still really good are the leading economic indicators in the United States. The PMI surveys, the sentiment surveys, they're all still really strong and not um, suggestive recession. You've said as recently as last week that there aren't, you know, inflationary wind, or, or excuse me, uh, recessionary winds. The only one that's blowing. The, the, there's a couple things that are on the radar screen now. At the beginning of this year, there were literally zero. Now there's a couple. One is this weird yield curve that we have with three twos, threes, and fives exactly the same. I, I wouldn't exactly call this inverted because they're all pretty much the same yield. But that's somewhat concerning when the yield curve flattens out. And also, consumer expectations are really bad right now. If you comp consumer confidence, their awareness of where things are today is still very strong. But if you compare their expectations for the future, it's amazingly weak compared to where they are. In fact, if you subtract uh, expectations for the future from expect feelings of current conditions, they're more negative than they were prior to the Great Recession. 
So consumers seem to be smelling something that isn't going right and probably has something to do with interest rates and home prices having gone up so much more than wages. What you see in these surveys of uh, is this a good time to buy a house, University of Michigan does this survey, it's pretty weak. It was very strong at the beginning of this year and now it's not very far off where it was prior to the last recession. So given all that you said, why isn't this simply a growth scare? Why isn't the economy doing better than you think? We had a rapid update, a CNBC rapid update that Steve Leisman does last week. Fourth quarter GDP ticked up 3%. Next yeah, year retail, is 2, re 4. retail sales were strong. And so so why, maybe the economy is better than, than people think? No, I, I, I don't. I, I think it's a debt based economy. So it depends what. When, when retail sales go up because people borrowed more money, is that really good? I mean, if you meet your, an old buddy of yours from college and you say, how you doing? And the guy says, I'm doing great. I've got a huge mortgage. I've got a second on top of that. I've got four credit cards all maxed out. And I got this brand new watch. I am killing it. And you go, he says, how are you doing? You go, gee, I don't know. I mean, I paid off my mortgage. I don't have any credit cards. I got a million dollars saved. Which one of you is doing well? I mean, the one that's consuming a lot might feel good in the moment, like our consumers feel good in the moment, based on the current confidence surveys, but their expectations of the future are weak. Well, that sounds like the guy that's your buddy in college. It doesn't sound like you that has actually saved and in a position to invest in the future. So I don't really think the economy is all that great. I think that when the deficit expands by hundreds of billions of dollars and you get a couple percentage of GDP, that's just debt. All you did was borrow money, and of course, it leads to short-term economic growth. But how are we going to keep this going when we have 1.6 trillion, 8% of GDP nearly, is what we're growing our deficit at? You've noticed there was a kerfuffle in Europe about Italy it was going to run a 2.4% budget deficit, and all the uh, mandarins were berating them for being, you know, uh, uh, irresponsible. Well, France is at 3.4. Look at these elitists telling in France at 3.4 budget deficit, berating Italy for being at 2.4, but the U.S. is at 6 plus if you look at the real numbers. You know, if you're, uh, it's a very large budget deficit that we're running, and that's what's driving our economy, and the corporate economy is also leveraged up at record levels record levels that previously have been harbingers of recession. You can't blame the CFOs at America's companies. They were given incredibly low interest rates by the extreme stimulus policies and that caused a yield starvation that collapsed spreads. Corporate yields were by far the lowest in history. And of course they leveraged up and borrowed money to buy back stocks and leverage up the corporate economy further. So we have a very high vulnerability to higher interest rates, and we are seeing that already. When we spoke a year ago, and I said, if, if the yields go up to 3%, stocks are going to take gas, that doesn't seem like a very high interest rate, does it? But it is when you have zero knit into the marrow of your economic bones, which is what we basically did by leaving rates so low for so long. So then you believe and agree with what Janet Yellen said last week? about corporate credit, what Paul Tudor Jones and others have been warning about. Well, I've been, warning, you yourself I've been warning about, about, about corporate credit for a long time. Um, I said in 2017, September, that when rates go up, the worst performing bond sector will be investment grade corporate bonds. And boy, was I right. I mean, corporate bonds have been bad this year. In fact, uh, I did a webcast last Tuesday. I haven't looked at the numbers since then. But emerging market dollar-denominated debt has stronger, had stronger year-to-date returns through last Tuesday than investment-grade corporate bonds. And that's amazing when you think about how emerging markets broadly have suffered with the stronger dollar in the tariff talks. So investment-grade corporate bonds have been bad, and at this juncture, there's some chance of them recovering a little bit if rates rise, because the spreads are wider anyway. But if rates rise... Um, significantly, the duration, the interest rate risk of that sector is very, very high. And if interest rates have the impetus to fall, which I 
do doesn't seem like they do because they're not acting well with the correction in the stock market, something bad has to be happening in the economy for interest rates to fall from here. Something really bad has to be happening, deflationary or recessionary, and that's not good for the default positioning of the corporate bond market. So corporate credit is, uh, I'm as negative on corporate credit, well I've been neg as basically maximally negative for about a year. Leverage loan market? Leverage loan market is less scary to me. Um, I know it's been weak lately with lots of outflows. That's because the market's repricing in the Fed. Leverage loans had a strong bid, as they should have, as the Fed was systematically raising interest rates. They float. I mean, leverage loans, there's portfolios that yield 6 even 7% if you go to lower credit. That's, that's pretty good when you look at the screen of treasuries yielding 3%. But leverage loans started to say, uh-oh, maybe the Fed's not going to keep raising interest rates. And maybe the reason they're not going to keep raising interest rates is this weaker economic data. So if I'm not going to get a, a coupon hike with the Fed and I might be worried about uh, a recessionary situation, well, they've sold off a little bit. But they're still, they're still the best performing bond sector. Um, year to date. What does it say to you, uh, and the FT had an interesting article um, yesterday or the day before, not a single company has borrowed money through the high yield market this month. Would yeah. be the first month yeah. that that's happened since November of 08. It's been a long time, yeah, zero issuance. What's the message in that? Well, rates are higher. I mean, they, they had so, so many opportunities to borrow money at lower interest rate levels, and then spreads blew out in October. Uh, high yield spreads went out by about 100 basis points, maybe even 125. And so uh, they're probably saying, maybe we'll get a better opportunity to do this. And also, the market is not all that liquid right now, and it's not that easy uh, like it was to, to float debt. Uh, there's a lot more concern with rates going up and spread, uh, spreads going out. So the market isn't all that welcoming to corporate uh, uh, debt borrowers, and that's, that, that's the message. Now, maybe, maybe there'll be a, a significant issuance in the first quarter of the year, uh, perhaps, and we'll see if the market can handle it. All right, we're gonna step away for a quick break. We'll come back, we have much more ahead with Double Lines, Jeffrey Gundlach from out here live and exclusively in Los Angeles. Welcome back to Los Angeles. We're live today from Double Lines headquarters on their trading floor with Jeffrey Gundlach, 12.30 in the east, 9.30 a.m., of course, locally. Let's talk about the risks out of D.C. Okay. You mentioned some of the policies. What about the midterm election results? What about the prospect of more hearings, the Mueller report, impeachment? All of that into the prism of how you see risks from D.C. affecting the markets or what? Well, none of that sounds like a positive. I mean, mid the midterm elections, I thought, would lead to, and maybe it's still possible, but there's so much contention. But I... I thought it would lead to perhaps even more spending from infrastructure because uh, the president has talked a lot about infrastructure and uh, that he wanted to do a do big build out. And it seems the Democrats were kind of on that same page. I think Nancy Pelosi was very in favor of that idea. Maybe they just are so, there's so much anathema, maybe they just can never get along. But if there's one thing they can do together, it's probably some sort of an infrastructure build. And that could just lead to more debt. Now, it could also lead to short-term stimulation of the economy, but it ultimately compounds that problem. When it comes to the, the hearings and the like, I'm starting to th treat that with, I wouldn't say a great deal of concern, but I was pretty dismissive about that uh, prior to the midterms. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that that seems to be building in a way that's problematic in terms of just, un just building uncertainty. So, yeah, the, the whole Mueller thing and um, almost the promises of forever, you know, investigations, that just strikes me as being unhelpful. You still, did you see the scene from the Oval Office last week? The oh, the ambush, sort of, of, of President, Schumer Vice and, President and Schumer, Pelosi? Yeah. So you, you, you it was still like think the Vice President wasn't really there, but yeah, but yeah Schumer and Pelosi and the President, I thought that was... Uh, uh, theatrical, uh, for sure. I, I, I'm not really sure what the purpose of that was. But you think infrastructure and things like that are possible after that setting? Uh, that's what scene? I, that's kind of how, why I prefaced my remarks the way I did. Uh, that scene was was pretty remarkable in terms of the um, contentiousness. So maybe n nothing happens at all except focuses on uh, these investigations, and that just strikes me as being a negative. I. You, you, we, you talked about the dollar was strong and all that. I, I believe that the dollar peaked out January of 2017. I said so at the time. 
It was at 103 on the Dixie Index, and then dropped all the way down amid. And it was uh, there was tremendous bullish sentiment on the dollar in, in January 17, and it dropped by about 15 percent from there down to the high 80s, and it rallied all the way back into the 97, 98 zone, uh, which I think is going to be the high uh, for the dollar. I think the dollar, the next big move in the dollar, I've been saying this for a long time, is uh, uh, I think the next big move for the dollar is down. And it has a lot to do with the deficit, it has a lot to do with the twin deficits. The dollar correlates very well with the size of the twin deficits. In other words, when the deficits are going much bigger, uh, in broad strokes, the dollar goes down. And I think that the dollar uh, could be under siege from other blocks and countries wanting for the dollar not to have reserve currency status exclusively anymore. <clears throat> And clearly, with the budget deficit at 6% of GDP going higher, there's no way that we would have the dollar at this level if we didn't have the global reserve currency status. China has been making moves definitely to try to come into that club. They've been buying uh, oil futures in their own currency uh, this year for the first time, and they've gotten up to double digits. And that's kind of a, a mechanism, I think, to try to show that you're of that stature. Um, there was a official at the ECB, um, I can't remember who it was, but he was saying we want the euro to be a global reserve currency. I mean, good luck with that one, given what's going on in Europe. But just it's just the sentiment of it that leads me to believe that the next big move in the dollar is down. So uh, I think that probably what I've been talking about for the last few months remains an important theme, and that is that the outperformance of the United States stock market was truly almost historically unique during the middle part of this year. The global stock market topped out January 26th, and then they all fell together, U.S. And, and the world, into May. And then a very strange thing happened after being so coordinated for a year. The U.S. stock market went on to make new highs, while the global stock market went to a 12-month low. Um, from May into early October, the U.S. stock market went up by over 10%. The global stock market went down by more than 10%. And I said in my September total return webcast, I said, this is very unusual. And if the global stock market heads back down and takes out that low of uh, September, then I think the U.S. will have to join it. And boy, was I right. I mean, the global stock market took that out. And October 4th, the U.S. stock market gave it up. And now since then, the, 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 they've been pretty much moving together again. And I think that that's important because the non-U.S. stock market is substantially uh, cheaper than the U.S. stock market, particularly the emerging markets in Asia are particularly, uh, and, and elsewhere, but I like the ones in Asia better, are, are a very cheap to U.S. stock market. And I think it's interesting that since we've had this market turmoil over the past couple of months, kind of quietly and without getting anyone's attention, the emerging markets have been outperforming. And I think that's a very good sign for their relative prospects, if I'm right, that we're in a bear market scenario. You like the emerging markets relative? US? Relatively. Because relatively. we sat here uh, you know, a year ago, you loved India. Uh, in well, I've India, loved India for years. India I, outperformed well, uh, the so other emerging markets slightly. Yeah, it's down. But I mean, I, I don't look at India as, uh, I, I, when I, I've, I've been recommending that for many years, and it's a multi really a couple decade type of a call. I tell people, look, don't open your statement. If you, if you buy India, you don't open the statement uh, because you'll probably have substantial drawdowns along the way. But the demographic situation and the need to absorb hundreds of millions of young people into the labor force is very reminiscent of where China was three decades ago. And I think that's going to be a, a, a long-term outperformer. Yeah, it's down about, I, I guess, 7% of your day. You're right, it's outperformed some other emerging markets. But that's more of a secular call. Um, speaking of China, how do you think the trade war plays out? How, how do you see it? Uh, Does it get worse yeah, from here? I, I, I think it gets worse. I, I think that China doesn't want to be told what to do by President Trump. And President Trump loves to bully people. So that's a bad situation. You've, you've, you've kind of got, you know, a, a irresistible force and an immovable object kind of working to, against each other. So I think they're probably, we're probably going to ratchet up the tariffs, I, I think. Um, I know that we put it on the 90-day 
uh, you know, delay. But I think that's that's a problem. And you can see the PMI for net export orders is tanking globally. I mean, it's Germany has fallen off a cliff. That that indicator was at an incredibly powerful reading entering this year. It was over 60. PMIs over 60 are really strong. And it's completely collapsed. I mean, it's, it's down way below 50 now. Even the U.S. has gone negative on that PMI. So that's, that clearly shows that the, the tariff situation and the trade wars are having negative impacts on actual economic activity. And it's just going to get worse if we ratchet up uh, another, another level. You don't, think China, China. you don't think China will blink? I mean, they've already made some moves that suggest they may be inching closer to that. Yeah, maybe. I, I hope so. But I don't believe that hope is a method in investing. I think you see identifiable risks and you need to take them seriously. And since the uh, slight back off, I think that's something positive. But given the personalities, I, I'm not optimistic that that's going to resolve itself without first causing more pain. You know, a lot of these things, they shouldn't happen, like the Fed shouldn't raise interest rates, but maybe they feel compelled to. You know, we probably shouldn't be running a trade war. I mean, I, I remember I did a remote with you where I said, hey, in elementary school they taught us about the 1930s and that it's a bad idea for the Fed to prematurely tighten and then to do tariffs with Smoot-Hawley in the 30s, which extended the Great Depression. But here we are again. And the Fed is kind of raising interest rates and the bond market says you shouldn't be doing it. And tariffs are never good for economic activity globally. The good thing for the United States on tariffs, though, Trump does have one really valid point, and that is that tariffs don't really hurt the U.S. manufacturing and U.S. output as much as they hurt other countries because we have about the most disengaged global economy of any developed country in the world. Only 8% of our GDP is exports. So it doesn't really hurt our output that much, but it hurts our consumers. We're getting a free ride by getting lots of cheap goods into this country. If we raise the prices through tariffs, that's bad for our consumers. It's bad for the standard of living of the United States. It might not be, it's bad for the global economy. It might even be worse for non-U.S. countries than it is for us. But it's particularly bad for our inflation rate, for example. I mean, if you raise the price of shoes, that's called inflation. If you raise the price of T-shirts none of which are really made in the United States, you know, that's, that's inflation. So I, I kind of think one of the reasons that bond yields have failed to react in a typical fashion to the weakness of the global risk markets is because that we see the potential for a higher inflation rate should tariffs continue to materialize. And we also have, um, this is one thing that is true, that there has been a little bit better wage growth. Uh, but wage growth being in excess of GDP is not really all that great for profitability. And that's another reason why we have a headwind and why I think we're in kind of a bearish uh, setup for uh, stock markets. Okay, we'll step away quickly again, take a quick break, come back live from Los Angeles with Jeffrey Gundlach, get some of his best ideas. Back live from Los Angeles, uh, exclusive here at uh, Double Line headquarters with Jeffrey Gundlach. Why don't you tell me about this new mutual fund that you've launched, what, combined with, is it, with Colony? Yes, yes. We, we started... Colony Capital. Yes, Colony Capital. Tom Barrick. Tom Barrick. Yeah, yeah. We, we started about five years ago a rules-based equity fund that was based on Dr. Schiller's work, the Double Line Enhanced Cape Fund. And basically, it's rules-based. We check, That fund picks equity sectors of the S&P 500 using the Cape Ratio evaluation methodology, and then we run a collateral pool in fixed income, and we have two ways of getting return. One is Schiller's rules work, and also we have, if we outperform LIBOR, which we've been able to do, then we get uh, Alpha, and that's been the best performing value equity fund in America over the last five years. And on the back of that, basically, we were approached by Colony, and they said, we have a rules-based idea, too. We're a big real estate firm. We have decades of experience in real estate. And we've come up with a way that we think that we can outperform the general uh, capitalization-based uh, real estate way of investing in brick-and-mortar REITs. And it's a very big universe, brick-and-mortar REITs. There's over 200 REITs in there, and um, they're 
tremendously diversified. It's not just malls and retail stuff. There's all kinds of things like, you know, data centers and the, the new economy that are also in REITs. And they came up with this belief based on their private market activity over the last few decades that many REITs that people are attracted to actually perform very badly. And one of the things is that the yield on REITs is often a false promise of future return. The highest yielding REITs tend to be very risky and they end up having uh, subpar performance and also very leveraged REITs tend to do very badly. So they came up with a methodology for selecting about half or 30 percent of the REIT universe and investing only in that subsection rather than just all of them. And they uh, came to us because of they knew that we had been doing something on the equity side, the S&P 500 equity side that was somewhat in that regard and it had done very well. And so they said, take a look at this. And so I just gave it to our analytical team that Sherman, our deputy CIO. So Jeffrey Sherman and you are going to be co-portfolio managers Yeah, it's here? going to be the same thing as, as uh, the, the, the Schiller fund. And he went through and his team tortured all the data and looked at it. And we just came to the conclusion that there seems to be something there. And it shows some pretty substantial outperformance versus other uh, re uh, investing, and so we're going to be doing that with our new mutual fund that's going to be launching. And we're ho we, th we think that it'll probably do the same as the Schiller Fund did, which is kind of way ahead of typical just stock picking or indexing types of uh, non-systematic investing. So we're, we, we are uh, optimistic on that. Also, investors have a really hard time investing in real estate. I mean, of, of the big institutions that uh, have the wherewithal because of their great size to buy buildings themselves, fully a third choose not to do it because it's just a pain and it's very illiquid and takes a lot of effort. So I think liquid real estate is a really interesting idea and that's what this fund offers. It's daily NAV, daily liquidity, and you can get in and out of it uh, as you wish without having to you know, hire a broker and sell a building. So uh, it also adds that liquidity feature, which I think is kind of uniquely attractive. It is an interesting time in, in real estate, commercial real estate, uh, given where the economy is that you think it, it is and where interest rates are going. Yeah. Right? So how I mean, does that factor into this? Well, it may, it, it may not. It, it's a relative performance thing again. Uh, it, it may not be the greatest time to be investing in risk assets broadly. It may not be, the, uh, certainly not the bottom in commercial real estate. Uh, but again, uh, as Sherman likes to say, you know, when we launched the uh, Schiller Fund, we weren't exactly wildly bullish on the equity market, and yet the equity market's done great, and the fund has substantially outperformed. So we'll see what happens. I think the, the key is to offer products, you know, when uh, you have the, the, the you know, the, the, the partnership that we have been approached with from Colony, and we don't want to pass on this, what we think is a really exciting opportunity. So given everything we talked about, we, we covered a lot of topics, what is your best idea for Cap 2019? Ca capital preservation. I've, I've been saying that for a number of months now, that this is a capital preservation market. I, I have uh, investors that come to me and they say, what, what's, what, what exactly is wrong with just buying the two-year treasury? And I say, I agree with you. I mean, what exactly is wrong with the two-year treasury yielding 270 when the 30-year treasury yields, two eight, the 10-year treasury rather, is 285? The S&P 500 yield is less than that of a T-bill. Um, I think we're in a bear market. I mean, I, I, I still think that it's an interesting time to own commodities, which have actually done pretty well. I talked about them uh, with you a year ago. And it feels like commodities are doing terribly, but amazingly, uh, through last Friday, uh, when I looked at it, or last Thursday, last time I looked at it, the Bloomberg Commodity Index is actually up over the last 12 months. Bonds are down. Stocks are down. Global stocks are really down. I mean, there's plenty of stock markets that are down over 20%. Many, many, many on a global base year to date. So this is, has been a capital preservation year. Um, I did say uh, in January that I thought the U.S. stock market would go up into the summer. Uh, I looked like an idiot in February because it, was, it wasn't going up. But I, I said it might go up as much as double digits, uh, and then it'll end with a negative sign. And that indeed is what happened. I, I, I thought that would be the case because I was bearish on the bond market, as, as you mentioned. I thought the tenure would go above 3%, and when it did, it would provide a tipping point. I still think that yields are headed higher in the United States. And I think it's mostly, mostly supply-based. Um, and, and, and lack of demand. So that, I think, is going to be uh, challenging 
for a lot of uh, parts of the, of, of the risk market. So it's, it's a capital preservation environment. I, I really think a short term, I mean, as, as unsexy as this sounds, a short term high quality bond portfolio is probably the best way to go as you, as you head into 2019. You think inflation's going to get out of hand, out of control? Oh, no. I mean, no, no, not, don't. no, absolutely not in the near term. In fact, the opposite is going to happen in the near term. The, we have a, uh, a model on the, CP, on the headline CPI, which has been remarkably accurate, given its simplicity. And that model shows that inflation is quickly going into the, into the mid ones, like because of oil, because of the energy price decline, down at 50 bucks a barrel now on WTI. And however, core inflation is likely to stay higher than it is now, I actually think. We have models on that, too, that suggest that that should head up into the mid-twos, and it's in the low-twos right now. So there's going to be this dichotomy between headline and core. And it'll be very interesting, because the Fed likes to parse their words, it'll be very interesting to see how they deal with this. Because when the headline inflation rate goes down to one and a half, you wonder if they can tighten anymore, because they've got this 2% belief, or whether they'll talk about transitory again. That, okay, we're down in the mid ones, but it's transitory because we're looking at core. Um, it's going to be a very tricky time. I don't envy Jay Powell at all. He's got a very difficult situation he's dealing with, with, uh, with all that's going on. Also, I think I, I have, we haven't talked about it. I think it's important. It's a point that I've thought to myself as I was coming in this morning I wanted to bring up. It's, it's the quantitative tightening globally, I think, is really an issue. The correlation between the world stock market and the cumulative size of the big four balance sheets, ECB, Bank of England, BOJ, and the Fed, is remarkable since they started quantitative easing back several, quite a few years ago now. They basically went up exactly the same. And when, and when the balance sheets took a pause on expanding, the stock markets globally took a pause. And then, thanks to the Fed's uh, embarking on quantitative tightening, the cumulative size of those big four balance sheets tipped over at the beginning of this year. And what happened to the global stock market? It tipped over starting on January 26th. But now the ECB seems committed, seems committed, that they're going to stop buying bonds, which means that they're going to start quantitative tightening. This is an extremely important event if indeed that correlation, which has held up so beautifully, even this year, continues to hold up, it means that we have a very big headwind for the Morgan Stanley Global Stock Market Index and all these countries that are in death crosses and bear markets. It's a lot of negative pressure. Uh, and I think that's super important and leads 2019 to be even more of a capital preservation environment. Let me go back to our headquarters. Uh, Joe Terranova is one of our traders uh, on the desk today. Joe, do you have a question I, I for Jeffrey Gunlock? Yes, I certainly do. Uh, uh, Jeffrey, you mentioned capital preservation. The last couple of years, we've heard so much about the movement towards passive strategies. You're obviously a very successful active manager. Someone listening to you today and hearing about capital preservation and being taught to just be a passive investor, how do they implement that strategy? Uh, um, I'm not at all a fan of passive investing. In fact, I think passive investing is a mania or reached mania status uh, as we went into the peak of the global stock market and the U.S. stock market. I think, in fact, that passive investing and robo-advisors, which I think tie together, are going to exacerbate the problems in the market uh, because uh, it's hurting behavior. So I wouldn't advise anyone to be a passive investor. I think you should invest capital preservation. I'm not going to tout my funds, but I think the, pass, the capital preservation means high quality, lower volatility, lower duration bond funds. Also, I think that capital preservation probably means uh, investing somewhat in uh, small percentage in commodity strategies, which I think will hold up reasonably well with a weaker dollar. So I'm pretty committed to the idea of a weaker dollar for the longer term. And so that means that the worst thing you can do is what everybody has done. Crowd into S&P 500 index funds because that's the most expensive market. It's the one, it was the last man standing. And it's the one, the reason it was the last man standing had something to do with the popularity of passive investing and herding mentality. And you know what, what leads you to the upside leads you to the downside. So I, my strongest advice is to not invest in passive 
U.S. equity funds. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I, I do recall it. I believe it was Iris own uh, in the spring where you talked about a bubble in passive and all of that money flowing into ETFs and other uh, places that helped push the, the stock market up. And when that money started to come out, one of the reasons why you thought the market was going to go up and then down was that it was going to, all that bubble was going to burst in passive and then there were going to be mm. uh, big ramifications from that. Well, the interesting thing about passive versus, versus active, which I, I find really hilarious, <laughs> is that we have sitting side by side a fondness for passive investing in the U.S. equity market and a loathing of passive investing in the U.S. bond market. One of the things that was the most popular entering this year was unconstrained bond funds. I mean, talk about active. I mean, you don't even know what they're doing. And I, I was cautionary about the broad category of unconstrained bond funds because nobody knows what the managers are doing. Some of them own stocks, some of them are long, some of them are short. And you can see year to date this massive dispersion in the unconstrained bond universe. There's some bond funds that are down five and six percent in the unconstrained category year to date. And there's some funds that are up three or four percent. So what are you exactly buying? But it is weird that you can live in a world where two diametrically opposed ideas are extraordinarily simultaneously warmly embraced. Passive in equity, and not just active in bonds, but uber active, right? Do anything, not even, not even a benchmark, not any type of, of guideline constraints. So it kind of shows you that there is no such thing as a one, one size fits all solution. In the, in the 90s, people loved passive bonds and they loved active equities. And now, 25 years later, it's exactly flipped. And as night follows day, mark my words, it'll flip back again. Mm. You reference in the, and in the few moments we have left, I want to talk to you about a couple of stocks you've talked about in the past. And you talked about one of them earlier, uh, being Apple. Uh, as being sort of the last straw. That was the last, the last man standing in the U.S. stock market was Apple. And it was, yeah, when they announced that they weren't going to tell you how many phones they sold anymore, that can't be a good sign. And I, I think, I, I've been marveling at um, consumers' willingness and anxiousness to f flip their phone to the new model, to, to roll it over so quickly. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm a Luddite, so uh, uh, maybe I just don't have the, the gene for this. But <laughs> these tiny changes to these phones. You still have a StarTac flip phone? or I <laughs> actually have a BlackBerry. It's, it's of almost no value because I can't do my email on it anymore. It's been discontinued. Bloomberg discontinued. It's actually a phone. <laughs> That's all I can do is use it as a phone. But I just think that the uh, rollover cycle for phones, I think it was 18 months was the replacement cycle, and I think it's pushing three years, I wouldn't be surprised if it turned into five years. And I think that's the fundamental problem that Apple has. Now, it's a cheap stock. It's certainly uh, not in any kind of trouble. But uh, the fact that it's rolled over is not really so much a commentary. I'm not really making a commentary on Apple, the company. I'm making a commentary on how emblematic that is of the market topping. Hmm. The other stock that you talked about uh, and, and we have a minute left, uh, was Facebook. Uh, you said it's sown that it was a short. And I said it's short for reasons that were so obvious. They were staring you in the face that what you thought was a community of safety and warmth was actually a diabolical data collection monster that would ultimately fall victim to regulation as, and when they fall victim to regulation, sectors collapse. Also, the e-commerce bubble looked exactly the same as all the other bubbles. I won't, we don't have time to enumerate them. And now that it's rolled over, I think it's, it's just done. So I think Facebook has really systematic problems. I, I said short it, Irisone, and boy was I right. It's down 13% since then. I want to thank you very much, Jeffrey.